rien. Oh. I know there's about them two moons she She was playing around out in the deal there by the camp, the bend in the river. And uh, all with their dog and whatnot. And then uh, late at night, the moon rose over the missions. Imagine around McDonald Lake, clear night in the summertime, and she was playing with her dog underneath the buggy. She'd look up and say, well, yeah, that's, that's right. Sometimes there's, they have two moons out. She's seen two moons. And it was two moons until the moon got round 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock at night and everything, and then, then she went to bed. But since then, she's, she had never seen that. Well, she was back in her teens then. Then over the years, well, and of course the fallen stars was uh, one of the deals. And we all seen that in Valley Creek and then every star fell from the sky and went down, hit one another and everything and whatnot, but then like Beaverhead said the next night, he says, by God, I'm going to go out and see. All the stars fell last night, and maybe we don't have any more stars. So he went back out, and everything was back up there. Other than the, the 13 world's greatest phenomenon stories and whatnot, well, that was one that was overlooked or something. This must have been back in uh, 48, 49, or 50, or somewhere in there, in one of them years. It's when that happened. And <clears throat> but along down the river there, that uh, mother's aunt and grandma, they used to tell her, well, go down the river. And uh, you see the buffalo turds go down there and play along there. They'll talk to you. The summer spirit, other than having the sun dances, but their spirit, it'll come and talk to you, give you a guideline and whatever for your, for your life. You'll have something to go by. When you're down and out or something, you lost the diff, you fell off the, the path, get on the wrong highway, it'll always come back and help you. So she'd run down the river by Sloan's and play along the sagebrush and the rocks see the buffalo turds out there. But maybe they never did say anything, anything to her. <laughs> <laughs> then there were times she learned uh, the river, fishing for steelheads and uh, trout, bull trout. But I can't remember any of them, uh, what kind of bait. A little eddy in the river or something, she'd use that. Different, different types of baits for spring and summer and fall, she'd use different baits, different hooks and different baits for them. <laughs> you can tell about where you, where your mom and your their place were at there. 
Mm, oh, yeah. <coughs> yeah, I right across the bridge on Sloan's. This day it's all cement. But it used to be a, the old wooden bridge. Two there. You cross that and then get on the south side or the west side of the river, then you go about a quarter of a mile. Then it used to be a little uh, cabins. Got mud and dirt on the roof. Log cabins. There's two, three of them in there. Then I think there was a root cellar of some kind in there. And Roy Atkinson bought the place and, and he tore the, some of the buildings down, built up corrals in there, and then he sold it back to the tribe here just a few years ago. Now it's back in tribal land. But then uh, there's some indications where the buildings were, you could tell. Yet, I think there's still one, partially up or something, I can't remember now. And, uh, Ma, she used to play around there with her aunt and grandmas and stuff. And then the geese in the spring, she learned the flights of the geese, what time of the year they come in, going north and going south. Now she just about learned the, their language. Early spring when they're headed north, well then the way they'd squawk and cackle and everything, well then she kind of kind of got the hang of it. Then in the, in the fall too, she kind of got the hang of it. When they they get there, she could tell just about the way they sound. If it's an early winter, a hard winter, or whatever, this type of thing. She learned that the Pacific Flyway, more or less. <laughs> of course, and then along both sides, well, on the west side of the river, more or less, it's, uh, there's a lot of places in there that uh, there used to be herbs and roots. And, other than bitterroots that they used to dig, and then that was to, for their blood tonics, body tonics. In the spring and the summer, they'd clean out by eating these different roots and whatnot, and for their ailments. And that she learned from the Naspers. And the Nez Perce was strong for that. They say, all winter long, you sleep and eat. You swallow all your slava and all your stuff. And you sleep all winter, and then the, your lungs, your insides are just full. Then come springtime, it's time to get it out. Take it out. Now you clean out. You get out of bed, and maybe you run fast and hard, quarter mile, quarter mile back. Then you sweat four and five in the morning, and you clean out. Then you eat these bitter roots, and that kind of replaces recleans your system. And in the summertime, people go out and get up in the morning. During the daytime, they get headaches, and they uh, walk around, they, they get dizzy because they never clean out. But you clean out in the spring, get rid of that stuff that you hoard all winter long, well, then no matter if it's 110 in the shade, 90 in the shade, you can run around out there and play or work, work, stack hay, 
and everything all day long. You can walk up the hill by the mile, pick huckleberries, walk back down, get up, sit down, lay down, get up. You don't get dizzy. You don't get short breath. <clears throat> this type of thing. That she learned from her nest pierce people. I said, lots of people don't do that. They don't believe in that. They don't believe in sweating when it's cold for three, four days in succession, you have to sweat, stuff like that, clean out. And in the summertime, spring and summer, you don't, you don't do nothing. Today, it's much simpler. Just sit around, lay around, and if you get sick, just get in the car and go downtown to the doctor, the white man doctor, and see what's wrong. He give you a bunch of pills, and you come home. It's a lot simpler, rather than going down the creek and helping yourself and taking a sweat bath and, and taking different roots and different barks of trees and clean your system out. Change oil, like, change your whole body. A lot of the Indian stuff, they, uh, if you get migraine headaches, you take one shot of that, and it's good for 25 to 30 years. No more headaches. Guaranteed for 25, next 25 years, 30 years of your life. Maybe the rest of your life. It's guaranteed. You, you implement the deal one time, and it's no more headaches, whether it's in the winter, summer, no more headaches for the next 30 years of your life. And your kids, if you're a woman, your kids won't inherit that. Your kids will grow up automatically for the next 30 years. They, they won't know what a headache is, because they inherit that. Because you were responsible enough to take care of this. You listened to your elders. You imitated the elders. They showed, your elders showed you the way. And you respected it. You listened, you was a good student, and you did it. And that's good. But nowadays, there's government Indians and reservation Indians or whatever anymore. Well, they, why should I sweat for three, four days? It's too hot or it's too cold. <laughs> and the white man, while well, he wants he, you can get migraine headaches, and you go downtown and buy a bottle of aspirin, Bayer aspirin or whatever, Tylenol. They want to make money. Every day they want to make money. They get a little bit of Indian uh, medicine to go with it, which is a good cure. But they cut it up, chop it all up, give you just a little taste of it, just a little tiny taste of it. But, <clears throat> but their, their way of world is money. If one medicine is bringing in million dollars a year, and everybody's buying it and using it, well, that's, it must be good. But you take an Indian medicine, it's good for 25 or 30 years. You, you do it one time, you won't have to bother with it. But you try to put that in with the white society, the Food and Drug Administration, the government and everything else, that don't go. Because they won't be selling it every week or every day. It's not going to bring that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> so it's no good. <laughs> but if it's something that's only temporary relief for a, an hour or two, well, that's good. You, you eat that up, it's good for an hour or two, 
Next day or next week, you run back to town and buy another bottle. Well, he's just selling it. There's 5,000 or 5 million other people doing the same. Well, that must be good because everybody's buying it. <laughs> but the Indian way, well, that was different. Because <laughs> a lot of that stuff was then that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's the way it's going to be f in the future yet, even this day. It's going to be that way. It's going to continue on. It's going to stay that way. It's not going to change. And uh, there's a lot of things that are going to stay that way. It's not going to change. And. Uh, a lot of them herbs and roots and medicines, well, uh, the people, they just... It's a lot easier to sit here and if they get sick, get diarrhea or baby problems or uh, skin problems, blood problems. It's a lot easier to just get in the car and go to town and see the doctor and then they'll give you pills or whatever. It's a lot easier to do that. It's much simpler. Rather than getting on a horse and going way up to that mountain. Many hours of hard riding. Get way up in the brushes, you get get slapped in the face with the brush, limbs, and horse and everything. And a beast might come out and sting the hell out of the horse and might buck you off or something. It's dangerous. And you get up there and you have to look for it. And you have to dig it and get your hands all dirty. And all that stuff. And you might have to wash it off. It takes a lot of work. Now you put it in a sack and you haul it back home. And then you might have to dry it, sun dry it or something. For several hours or several days. Make sure the cows don't eat it or... Well, the pigs don't eat her, the horses don't eat her, or goats or something, or sheep. Then you can, then you have to put it away then. But it's much simpler just to sit here and watch TV all day and you get sick, you get in the car and go to town and you get the stuff and you come home and that's it. <laughs> Nowadays a lot of the Indians are like that. They're, I take the simple way of life. <laughs> but something they'll have to go to town every day or every week or every spring or every summer or every winter. <laughs> it's a lot easier. <laughs> but if they go back to the Indian way, well, that's, it takes work. You might get dirty, you might get dusty, you might get muddy. <laughs> but then you won't be out to, you won't have to be bothered with at least the next 25 years or 30 years <laughs> no there's a lot of stuff yet and even this day and the annals of the machine age of today and well, the space Deals going around the earth and going up to the moon and and all that. There's a lot of this stuff in the Indian way. Not only this tribe, but other tribes in Montana, the Blackfeet, the Crows, the Crees, the Grovants. All a lot of this stuff still still exists. They are still very much alive today. They can come into being, they can come into the picture. They are very much alive. Among the Nazpurses to the west, Naspelums, Yakimas, Cayuse, Lapways, and Round Welpin, Spokane. It's not everybody, but well, there's a few people that, 
that know about it. And a lot of this stuff, too, that uh, some tribes have taken it up where they, uh, they go back and they learn that. These herbs and roots. And even now, we got our daughter-in-law and she had cancer when she first come and joined the family. Now she's, she's pretty well over it. And I am glad I'm, we're one that's still cling to our Indian way of life. And I'm sure glad that it was just a s small stepping stone that we went back. We look back maybe several hundred years. And people are dying right and left with cancer. And they're going seeing the doctor every day, every year. They're going seeing the doctor. Well-educated professors, you name it, they're dying. They cannot get over that. And, but going back to the old time medicine, by God, that, that was something. But that's one part that, that we're glad of. <laughs> and a lot of Indians died. A lot of our friends died. A lot of white people died. trained me when I was small. Each spring should. Hot like a Time to sweat. Every morning, about four o'clock, go down. She'd already made the sweat. Bring the rocks in. She'd go in one time. She'd come back out and run back up the house and get me out of bed. I'd go down, sweat. <laughs> but over the years, there's a lot of things I did not know. But in time, I learned I had a partner. That's stupid. Sweat. He could be walking right around here. He could be standing right there. We can't see him, we can't hear him, or we can't feel him. But he's here. That's stupid. Over the years now, I can look back and I can say he was with me. Sometimes, some places changed the whole contour of my way of life. I had goals, I had, I was headed down that highway in one direction. But I was, made a detour, went another direction. And by doing so, I picked up some information along the way. I had my faults in lots of ways, in many places, in many instances. I failed. I made wrong mistakes, wrong decisions, and the like. And then Tupi had come back and he'd help out. Even right in town, right in the powwow, right in the big celebration. Tupia was there. He was there all the way through. Even right in town. Even the time I was in the service, in the Navy. I can't remember those. Several thousand people, white people. Tupia was there. I, I didn't see him. I felt him. I know he was there.
<laughs> There's 5,000 Navy men, then the Marine base is not too far. There's another five or ten there, and then the city, and no one knew. But I could look up to the sky and I could see, and I could feel. <laughs> <laughs> but that's some more or less uh, what mother didn't have too much life down the river she spent most of it in her teens and her father Jackson while well, he came and went and he was fairly young them days too and he Captured a lot of wild horses, and broke them, then he'd take them to Idaho and trade them off for other stock or other cattle. Then he'd take that bunch and he'd go to Oregon and do, do some trading there. Then he'd take that trading stuff, go to Yakima or Nespelum, and he made the rounds out like that. Then he'd come back several months later. See, in the wintertime, he'd stock up on stuff. In the spring, he'd break them out, and then he'd go on the summer circuit-like. Then he'd be gone all summer, and then this, in the fall, and he'd get home. Then he'd go around rounding up horses and stuff like that. I know one time they had Bunch of horses up by Buffalo Bridge, west of Polson. Ineas Quickwissu was there. Oh, there's quite a few of them were there. Some of the Pablos or Allards and uh, Quickwissus and there's a lot of these Indians here too, but they just had the Indian names, but don't know what their English names are. They had this big white stallion in, in a corral. The corral was 10, 12 feet. And this horse would just about make it out. He'd run around the corral and he'd crawl up the poles. And he'd just about crawl out. I sundown one of that white pony. He passed the word back from Idaho. If you guys catch that pony or get him in the corral, save him for me. And that's when Enius Quikusu went over. And he helped him and uh, Whispin Charlie, I guess. They were young. And I said, boy, that's one horse they wouldn't have nothing to do with. The rest of the crew wouldn't have nothing to do with that horse. He'd bite, he'd strike, he'd kick, he'd run after a man on a horseback. And they didn't want nothing to do with it. So said sundown. He wants it. So old man Quikasu went back and Sundown was back at Rocky Butte. He went over and they got him in the chute. He put his saddle on, hackamore, his angora shaps, and he crawled on the thing. And <clears throat> went around the corral a couple dozen times, and he said, open the gate. And so they opened the gate, and the way he went across the sagebrush down the river there someplace. <laughs> and he spent a day and a night somewhere down the river toward the hot springs or someplace. And he come back to the place on Rocky Butte. Mother never paid attention to all his doings. And see, all oh, once he come in riding a white horse. It was tame, broke, gentle. Come riding in the, to the yard and got off, took his saddle and everything off. Now, where'd you get that horse? And, oh, I got him down the river. <laughs> but that's... <clears throat> my 
mostly what they did, what he did. Then a lot of these uh, pack outfits, he'd supply and furnish horses for the dude ranches. And in a lot of cases, as far as the rodeo went, well, the uh, people knew it. And uh, the producers and everybody else, well, they just, they, uh, they'd let him ride, they'd pay him $50, just put on, put on exhibition, but not no contest but he'd put on exhibition for $50. So that's how he rode in, in the rodeos. But as far as contesting, well, the rest of the boys knew they didn't have a chance. He, he'd, he'd always win. And I guess it's quite a show the way they tell about how, he, how he'd ride a horse. They just, he just blends in with the horse or something. I don't know, it's, it's quite a show, I guess. <laughs> and uh, but in a way, sir, some spirit used to help him, I guess. When he was young, a little boy, over by Helena or Bozeman, Three Forks, maybe around Three Forks, Three Forks, Montana. That's. He was just a little boy, sundown. They used to, people used to go back in there and they, on their excursions and whatnot. Well, I was on a little, this little ridge. He used to play. And the rest of the women folk and people that gather roots or whatever they was doing, gathering and whatnot. And the sundown, he'd run down the ridge and he'd play and play. There's a pile of rocks and he'd play and play. Then he'd fall asleep. Sleep all afternoon or whatever. Take a siesta or something and they'd call him and call him. Finally, they'd wake him up and he'd come running back and then they'd come home. But this one day, his mother, his grandma went over there. She said, I'll go find out. How come he likes to play at that one spot? So she walked over there. She seen this, this little fort deal like, pile of rocks in a circle. That's where he plays. Then a little ways to the east, laid some skeletons. People that were murdered or killed. Maybe it's different tribes or whatever. Here are the skeletons laid. Boy, she grabbed hold of sundown. Don't you never do that. Don't you never come here no more. <laughs> That's a bad omen. That's no good. <laughs> Boy, she bawled him out. <clears throat> Over the years, just before he died at Jacksper, Idaho, well, he related the story there then. Someone asked him about it and said, yeah. He'd go to sleep and he'd see this Indian warrior with a knife in his mouth and all painted up, his horse in the back, was sneaking up at him. But he was in that fort, in that little deal. Scouts used them on the points, high points, the little pile of rocks. But he was, a, and he couldn't get in. He'd go around and around, and, so that's where he stayed. <laughs> he <was protected>. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's... <clears throat> but then that Indian, whoever, whatever tribe that was, and that horse had something to do with his life. That's the way he could ride any horse. And when he grew up, 
He could ride any horse then. <laughs> and he could tell a horse if he's good breeding. <clears throat> if that horse is going to have good colts, good hooves, good bones, good blood, good stamina, and if you break him once and train him once, and that's all it'll take. It's not, not, not like these horses these days. They're so crossed up that all you printer have to break them every spring. They're so high, hypered. So darn, well, fired up. And then they'll throw colds, they'll have throwbacks and all that stuff. But then he, he could tell which line of horses, or some horses that have it, have all the stuff in them, but doesn't project, doesn't show, doesn't stand out. It's in them, but it doesn't show. And he'd pick them horses. Then them horses, when they get a little one, even if it's in the winter time, well, they won't have no coughs, diseases and all that kind of stuff. And they can run, they can do all that stuff too, and as well as these high-powered horses. <laughs> but these high-powered horses, well, they, they catch every damn disease within a hundred miles. <laughs>